Hello and welcome to another video in my series on automating Pokemon with hardware mods and fun software. Uh, in this one we're going to talk about the 3DS project and I previously did another video on my 3DS project. I will link that in the description, uh, but we took this to a completely different level. This first 3DS project only pressed buttons and didn't interface with the uh, touchscreen at all or the directional pad. I actually didn't do the directional pad either, but the techniques that I did here would be applicable to that. Uh, and so now we have this much more messy and <laughs> slightly elongated uh, board where I'm now able to control the touchscreen. And I want to walk you through first why I did this, uh, but also the technical aspects of this. And for that, we're gonna go over um, a, a helpful uh, GitHub repo that has some nice diagrams and was very useful in figuring this out. Uh, but I basically cracked open my 3DS again and wired some more wires to it. Um, the relevant ones are actually in this little rectangle down here. These are the ones that control the touchscreen. Initially wired to those, but didn't take notes. And so I lost my wires and ended up uh, ripping apart the connector here <laughs> and soldering uh, wires directly to it here. So I uh, took apart a different DS and stole the standard four pin um, ribbon cable for the resistive touchscreen. Uh, but most of the technical aspect of this I got from Deku Nukem's 3XT DS project and this PDF from reading through it. Uh, but they basically did a very similar thing to what I was doing. They have a capture card in here, so ignore that part. Um, but they were soldering wires to particular points on a 3DS. I think theirs is on an XL, which is slightly easier than mine. Um, also, there are test points for L and R, but they didn't find them, but that's that's on them, doesn't matter, whatever. Uh, they also did the uh, circle pad, the, the analog pad, but I didn't care about that. The thing that I was mostly interested in is the resistive touchscreen. And um, I'm gonna oversimplify this. It's a, a little bit more complicated than this, but basically the way a resistive touchscreen works is there are uh, basically two voltage sources and two voltage sinks, and the hardware alternates between the two of them to read the values, uh, because this is essentially a resistor grid, and a resistor allows you to do voltage splits, and so you can read the voltage output to know where on this uh, resistance grid you're, uh, you're pressing. And uh, you can know whether you're pressed or not uh, as to whether any of the resistance is, is driven to ground when you do uh, one of them. Again, oversimplification, and I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, I kind of do because I, I did this and I figured it out, but uh, it's, it's, I might have misspoken there, but it's, it's sort of like that. Uh, and in order to do that, um, and yeah, here's like, basically they did the same thing I did. They got an extra cable here and wired out to it. Um, you can actually wire directly to the test points and not destroy your touchscreen like I did, but um, yeah, it didn't matter because I'm not going to use that 3DS for anything else. I also hooked up the same resistors that they, they mentioned here. Uh, and this is the important part. This is the um, electronics part of this. And I don't have an oscilloscope, so this was very difficult for me to debug by hand. Um, and so I was mostly guessing and checking and uh, computing timings on stuff. Um, but basically what you need to do is when uh, you drive the Y reading to ground, you drive, drive it low, and in this case, it's going to say, oh, a touch has started, and it will start pulling for each of the Y and X uh, coordinates. That's kind of what these two bumps are here. Uh, when it pulls Y high, it's reading the X value, and when it pulls uh, X high, yeah, when it pulls X high, it's reading the Y value. And so that's how you get the two values out of your grid of, of touchscreen. Now, the tricky part with that is you need to both detect when this is going to happen, then you need to wait a certain amount of time in order to spoof it. If you're doing a real touchscreen, I mean, the touchscreen would just implement it for you. In order to spoof it, I need to detect when this is happening. Basically, I can keep my X voltage at whatever coordinate that I want all the time because it doesn't read uh, it doesn't read the touchscreen state from X, it reads it from whether Y is pulled low. Uh, so I can keep Y low to initialize a touch, then uh, it's going to pull Y high and read X. When it pulls Y high, I know a fixed offset from that. I can set Y to the value it needs to be, and it's going to pull X high to read that. 
You could also detect X being high and then respond very quickly. However, changing voltages in my experience took about 140 microseconds, which is far too slow in order to react to this. Uh, these windows here, I think, are about 100 microseconds wide and 500 micro microseconds apart. Uh, and so I needed to detect this very narrow window, wait a very precise amount of time, and then set a voltage at a particular timing after that. Uh, and that was my first problem, is I'm using an Arduino Micro. This is from a different board, but still an Arduino Micro. It has uh, analog to digital converters on it, which are which I can use to sense things. However, the resolution of those is right around 120 microseconds. And so if you have a if you have an error bar of 120 microseconds and you're trying to find something that's 100 microseconds wide, you're going to miss almost always. Uh, but it turns out you can tweak the ADC settings on the Pro Micro and get it down to only 11 to 12 microseconds to read that. And then you can hit this bar very, very easily. Uh, the next thing that I ran into is setting the voltage on my digital to analog converters, my little DAX over here, uh, these guys. Uh, they're on an I2C bus, and an I2C bus uh, takes about 140 microseconds on this microcontroller to, actually, I think standard is 280 microseconds to set them, um, but I think mine was about 140 and i had no idea i was going in blind i assumed that they were very fast but relative to the the time scale that i'm aiming for they're, they're pretty slow uh, and so after figuring out the timing i was able to set the delays to right uh, just the right amount and i was able to press buttons on the touch screen now i wanted to walk you through why i was even doing this in the first place so i was trying to find a pokemon called del caddy in pokemon black and white uh, specifically in white 2. It is a version exclusive in white 2. It only appears in one particular place in Castellia City, and it is a 5% encounter. The base shiny rate in uh, in those games is 1 in 8,192. A 5% encounter is 1 in 20. Uh, and so this is about how many encounters you would need to find one shiny. Now, this number of encounters, uh, and I was getting an encounter... Uh, about once a minute uh, is 120 linear days of time. Now there are some ways to speed this up. So let's put this 8192 times 20. There's some ways to speed this up. The first is with the shiny charm in black and white two, uh, white two, which I believe increases the odds to, why does it not show? Okay, here we go. In uh, black and white 2, it reduces it to 1 in 2730. So 2730. Still looking at like a 40-day expected value. Pretty slow. Uh, but it turns out with the touch screen, you can do some uh, kind of tricky things. I have a video of it here. Don't mind this janky screen recorder at the bottom. Uh, with the touch screen, you can use what are called pass powers in black 2 and white 2 on the C gear. So I need to click particular parts here, click this, press A. Uh, you can do pass powers. There are two important ones. One is exploring power, which makes the rustling grass, which is only where the encounters happen, much more common. Uh, and the other is, I forget what it's called, lucky power. Yeah, lucky power, which increases the shiny rate. Um, and then after that, I basically walk back and forth. You actually don't see it. The player just sort of wiggles because uh, I need very precise timing, and so I don't actually pull the screen during that. Um, but then it finds little shaky grass and tries to encounter the Pokemon there. Um, but with the uh, exploring power, it's now about one in every 20 seconds. So that improves that quite a lot. Uh, and with the, it also increases the rate at which um, a, a Del Caddy appears. So instead of being 5%, it's 30%. So. Um, about one in three, and we'll, we'll say one in four and just to overestimate it. Um, I could probably get the correct fraction here, but it's not, uh, <laughs> not important for this. Uh, oh, I guess I could, one in five? And we'll just say it's one in four. Uh, it also improves the shiny rate too, so it becomes one in 2048. And so with this, you know, the, the expected value comes down quite a lot just by being able to use the touchscreen. 
um, but just to show, you know, it, it's able to encounter Pokemon and I can programmatically do that. This is still janky because I have a camera over top of the 3DS to actually capture this. But uh, And then I use the delay in how long it takes for it to appear to decide whether it's shiny or not. And then repeat the process over and over and over. Uh, but that's basically what I use the touchscreen for and why why it was totally worth it. Ended up getting it in about four days. So I was like double double odds, but hey, four days is a lot better than 120, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, but yeah, that's this project and that's how I was able to add touchscreen support to my uh, 3DS hardware mod. Hopefully you found this interesting and I will see you in the next one.